Hello. Hello, welcome everyone to the um, Blue Chip Beats panel, which is going to talk about music and uh, brand integration. My name is Matt Jagger. I'm head of branded entertainment at a global marketing agency called Naked Communications. Uh, but prior to that, I was in the music business for 16 years and main, mainly in dance music. So this is a, a conference and a subject very close to my, my heart and my career. Uh, we have a very prestigious panel here. Uh, I do quite a number of these uh, brands and entertainment uh, conferences around the world, and it's usually a smattering of agencies. Uh, but today we have the brands, and we don't just have the little brands, we have uh, four massive brands here. Um, we have Nokia, O2, two sides of O2 in fact, and uh, Coca-Cola. So if there's ever a time to ask questions about brands and music, you've got some really great people in the room. Um, I'm going to start by asking each one of my panellists to say who they are uh, and tell us a little bit about what they're doing in music and why they're doing it. So if I can start with you, Theo. Hi, yeah, my name's Theo. Um, I look at, I'm the global... Uh, Music Marketing Partnership Manager for Nokia, very long title. Um, my role is really to take some of our marketing campaigns that we do on a global scale around the world and, and bring them to life working with artists, uh, publishers and anyone really from the, from the music industry. Um, my name is Jasmine Ski. I'm a music sponsorship at O2 and I look after the Live Nation relationship which includes... Um, the 15 O2 Academy venues that we have around the country and priority ticketing at those venues as well as um, with Live Nation. Um, Nilla Donnelly and I um, also work for Music Sponsorship O2 and I look after the O2 uh, and manage the rights around that naming um, partnership. Um, I look after the AG Live relationship as well um, and working with promoters, artists, agents who come into the venue. Hello, Eric from Coca-Cola, uh, marketing manager for Energy Drinks. Um, yeah, we are doing, as you might have seen yesterday, the development of Burn Studios and the whole relationship with the artists and as well with the community. So we are very community focused on this. So this is what we try to kick off in the last year. Thanks. Um, so when music and brand started kind of working and integrating with each other, it was mainly about sponsorship and badging, um, largely for awareness and association. Since then, Things have really moved on, and we're talking much more about engagement, consumer loyalty, and community building. But what I want to ask Theo from uh, Nokia is, do you think there's still a role for the, the big name badging and association of sponsorship? Um, depends who you are, really. I think, you know, for us, uh, we're like a technology platform, so a lot of the pieces we do, we don't really badge. Um, it's not about the Nokia awareness. It's more about using the technology and utilising that with this you know, sector, the music sector. So whether that's working on an event um, or building an app for an artist or those types of pieces. So for us, it's like showcasing some of our new technology um, and not really branding. Like uh, a lot of the gigs we do, there's no branding in, inside the venue. So there might be Nokia Presents, but once you go inside the venue, there's not a single Nokia logo. That's interesting. And Eric, um, you, as Coca-Cola, you, you do some very, very big name, um, if you like, spot sponsorships and partnerships, but you're also involved much more at grassroots. For you, how do you strike that balance between the two, two, two elements? Um, yeah, I think that's, a, that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest um, yeah, challenge what we have at the moment. So to say, okay, on one hand side, you need uh, the awareness very quick, as, as a brand always needs awareness. On the other hand side, we see very clear that this time is getting more and more over, honestly. So for brands like us, to just to sponsorship deals. So we try to invest much more into, into the core of the people, so into the community, and to have just as an add-on, I would say, the sponsorship deals to, to, to balance the, the awareness, to keep the awareness on, on, the, on the, call it now, um, bigger level. But the whole creation has to come from the community, so we try to invest, to balance the investment there very clearly at the moment. So it's different for... Energy drinks, for example, so coming back to the point from Nokia saying we are smaller categories. For Coke, it is sponsorship deals. So for Coke, it's very clear it's around sponsorship deals to use it as an awareness tool. And if you're, um, if you're interested in, in getting consumer engagement, um, how important is, is exclusive content in, in facilitating that? What, what, that's a question for you, Yasmin, because I know this is an area that you've been moving into. 
Um, yeah, I think what's key is um, what, we've, what we've done with the academies is when you're looking at content, um, consumers now, they get it for free, uh, they save it for free, and it's, very, it's something that then they don't tend to to want to buy. So what we looked at was 80%, we found 80% of our consumers were actually engaging with YouTube, listening to music, finding, discovering music. Um, so it became a platform that we really need to, to build so that we could actually engage with people that were going to um, live music venues throughout the UK. Um, and from that we developed O2 Academy TV, which is a YouTube channel based on um, taking what people are doing at gigs, filming, um, actually filming the show, which everyone does and um, most artists support now, and then um, taking the actual soundtrack that the artist has actually um, performed that night and editing it so the footage goes on to the actual music. Um, and it's become something that we've done at the O2 and is now venues. Um, it's very much something that artists are supporting. Um, and I think by creating content that you own and you're giving people an experience that's beyond... Um, the, the experience they've had at the venue, it's something that you can um, continue to talk to them through, through them, sorry, as a brand. And obviously that, that's, that's quite co a complicated rights uh, issues involved perhaps with, with creating that content. How, how are you finding working with the, the various rights owner, be that the performer or the record label or the music publisher? Um, the challenge we had at first was most venues, if you go, I, I think, throughout the world will actually say you cannot film, even though um, artists encourage it and, and fans do it. So the first thing that we needed to do was get the signs down where they said you couldn't film and actually encourage people to film the artist. But we're dealing directly um, with the artist through the label. Um, the artist has to agree to it, so the, our main contact there is with the label. Mostly a manager will um, approve it as well, but uh, artists love it as well because it gives them something to post on their social networking sites. It also gives them a chance to show their fans how good they sound um, live, and live is such an important part of performance now. Um, Nula, do you, think it's, do you think live content is more engaging than recorded content? Um, I, I think... That if it depends where it's coming from, I think we've. Um, if you try and sell live content, I don't think that works. I think if you give away live content or, like Daz is um, describing, engage fans in creating the live content, then I think there's a huge appetite for it and it's massively important. Um, I don't think it's any more important than the the pre-recorded stuff um, because obviously you need to hear the pre-recorded stuff, I guess, to to spark that interest in the band. Um, so it, it, it's wholly dependent, I think, on, on the artist, on the event that's coming in, and also the nature of the fans that are involved, because like, the, the range of artists that we get through at the O2, um, some of them obviously don't want us to be um, distributing live content as such, because um, uh, they're very protective, obviously, of their brand and, and their live recordings. Yeah. Um, we're also very yeah. conscious that we've got a, a very short window of um, relevance after the event has happened. So if we start trying to distribute live content, um, the maximum probably is about three days turnaround before we can get that back out to the fan base before they sort of lose a bit of interest. Um, so it's wholly dependent on the artist. Um, and is the longevity of recorded content a factor in your move into that, Eric? Sorry? Is the longevity of, of pre-recorded content over live content a factor when you, that has influenced your decision in getting involved with that, with remixes and the studio side? So for us, I think it's very clear that, that both... How, how, you mean how that balance is for us between yeah. live and, yeah. and recorded? Um, what we try to do is to have um, the same concept with Burn Studios in a live and in a, in a, in a recorded online environment, so meaning... We have the possibility to do it online on the Burn Studios, but you have as well the opportunity to go, as we said yesterday, to the to the Hacienda to come back to Ibiza and do it live. So to have the, the same experience that you can connect the dots, not only do you have one way or another, we believe very strong also to amplify this point, that you have to have both. So it cannot be just an online or just recorded, but just a live experience. So for us it's to, to involve um, the story more and more, and therefore you have to get back to a live as well. So we don't think that they can only do it on the... Yeah, I mean, I, the reason I, I, I posed that is because I, I was interested because I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are making recorded music as well as performing it, and I was just to see whether there was an equally valid route for brands, brands to get involved with. Um, and again, I think this is one hopefully that the audience would uh, be interested in is where does working with new talent come into the equation for you as brands? I mean, it, we've all seen the big... Uh, sponsorships that, that you guys have done. Um, 
Theo, is this an area that Nokia might be interested in? Um, we do work with new talent. Uh, to, I work on a global role, so it makes it a little <coughs> bit more difficult. That's a full programme, but on a local level in the UK and around the world, I've helped on bringing some new artists in. We've also worked when we first started developing apps with new acts coming in and um, trying to really sort of experiment with that piece. I think sometimes with new acts, it's a lot easier to come up with new technology and, and, and get some more rights um, first out. So that's really what we do. But on a global level, it's not something that we, we've got in at the moment. Is that motivated for you, Yasmin? Yeah, it is. I mean, if, you've, if you know what O2 does in the UK, um, we've worked with some really big artists, Foo Fighters, Gorillas, in terms of um, elevating priority ticketing and, and showing our, like driving awareness for our customers. But um, a big part of doing setting up this O2 Academy TV channel is that we have 5,000 gigs across the year in our 15 venues. Um, so from an activation point as a brand and having a budget, it allows us um, to get involved with an artist that's an Academy 3 that's playing at 3 you know to 300 people as well as someone that's playing at Brixton to 5,000 and by creating content with that artist and putting it on this platform which is supported heavily with you know a media spend and comms um, we're helping drive their fans to obviously the channel but fans of other artists are also being exposed to that so it's very much part of um, supporting up-and-coming talent. Eric you you've actually you know put a lot of investment in into this area with Burn Studios which you unveiled is it a year ago today or close? Um, really, really, and really, it was yesterday. So it was one year ago we kicked it off, yeah. and now we're back here. <coughs> Has it been a success? And if if so, why? And if not, what would you like to do um, more of? So the, the, the whole last year, I think, was a success where where we learned a lot as a, as a brand. I think this is what what we have to make up our mind. We have to engage the community to talk to us, uh, saying what is the right how how the community is seeing the world. So we try not to say how we see the world in music. So I think we try to uh, invite, and this was the last 12 months, a, a, big, a big success for us. If the, if the whole Burn Studios come, will be a big success, will again be how, we, how good we are getting the, the community on board to develop the site and to develop the, the whole story further. So it is a, it is a living process. It's, um, but the investment itself so far paid back for us, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's interesting on this is that out of the, the, the brands represented here, your product is not something that, that has, if you, one could say, an intrinsic role within music. Obviously, Coca-Cola's been in music for such a long time since you know, they wanted to teach the world to sing. It's like 50 years ago, I think. Um, do you think that that sort of move that Coca-Cola have made, and obviously Converse are in this area, and Red Bull and a bunch of other brands, do you see that's a move that... a uh, a mobile operator or a mobile network should be making new. Um, I, th I think actually the way that O2 approach music has changed quite significantly when we first started um, back with our wireless festivals. Um, we did do lots of handset demos and you know um, promoting digital downloads mm. to people and, and various different music download services. Um, if you come to the O2 now, you will never be t be tried to s to be sold a product or be given away a, f a free mm. sim. Um, and I think jazz is pretty similar at the academy venues as well, is where we are massively protective of what we do in music. Um, and we sort of um, have to fight O2 to, to leave us alone and let us get, get on with what we think is the best way to, um, for O2, I guess, to be in music and engaging with people. Um, and so for us, it's not about product demos and um, selling. It's actually just about building that relationship with customers so that they have a, a better opinion of O2 so that the next time they walk into a shop and they're thinking of upgrading, O2 is the brand that's top of mind because they um, have a bit more of a deeper relationship with them. Right. I mean, I think for, for me, see, when I was sitting on the other side of the table, when I was in the record business, I was always surprised that a, a brand hadn't made that move into being much more involved in uh, the creation of music and, and almost like the, 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 the main financier of, of a, a new artist. And if we can, look, we can look what happened with, with Red Bull in, in Formula One, for example, where they, they nurture the talent, they have two teams, uh, it, you know, it's they're completely and utterly involved in Formula One, um, like, like, like the other, like Honda or whatever. Um, do you think this is going to happen in, in music, um, Thea? Um, I, I like to think that the record labels have got a talent for finding new talent and we like working with them. Um, yes, I think you know, it seems to be the obvious 
move and that's been muted for years and years and years but I think that's more on the distribution side and which which has happened but actually finding the talent and um, you know we make phones and uh, there's a whole other business that's really good at finding the talent and I think it's where the two meet um, there are obvious advantages later on down the line but you know Red Bull is Red Bull Racing Formula One is like one example, but there's hundreds that don't work. I think, you know, I've worked at T-Mobile before and those ideas have been muted over and over again um, about starting labels because there seems to be an obvious business relationship to it. But, you know, it's not easy to find new talent. I've worked, my background's a record company as well. And if I knew how to do that, then I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be sitting on my own island talking to you <laughs> via, via, via my mobile or something, you know, so... That's sort of our, my feeling on it. And Matt, sorry, I, I'd just yeah. add to that. I think one of the reasons why O2 is so successful and has been successful in music and building up credibility is because we're very aware of what we're good at and what our strengths are and what we can add to um, a, an artist campaign from um, a financial point of view, a marketing point of view, um, possibly innovation just because of the access we've got and the freedom, I guess, um, that we've got to um, talk to various different um, industries and agencies to come up with new ideas of how to market to people. And I think we're successful because we understand our position and we're not trying to move into being a record label. Um, and I think that's where some other brands fall down because they, they take that leap, um, or that one leap too far and um, it all backs fire. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> I think, sorry, just to add on that again, is, um, you know, we see ourselves more as the enabler. So you know, when we work with artists and support them, that might be down to an event. It might be how we distribute it via social media or also maybe working with your traditional um, traditional pl platforms like TV channels, etc., or preloading it onto a phone or those types of pieces. So we let the talent do what they do and just help them get it out to the public. I mean, your, your, your company's closest to this, Eric, really. I mean, I don't know if everyone's aware, but I think the, the World Cup record that you did was, was that number one in 18 markets last year? The, uh, the Canaan track? The, the, the competition was, yeah. Yeah, so you, you're, you're the closest. Do you see this as something that Coca-Cola will ever get into? Um, no, uh, because I think there are, also amplifying these points, there are clear, um, clear roles in every business. And um, our role is, is to, to provide one inside the drink and another inside to enable people with the support that we're giving to get bigger or to get more exposure or to be able to do what they want, to be creative. I think that's our job. Our job is not to, to, to sell records. Um, there are people involved in this, in this business. And our idea is also not to, because now we're working very close together with these people, with uh, bookers, promoters, and so on. And our, our idea is not in two years go back and say, oh, by the way, now we do it on our own and you don't have business anymore. So our idea is there is a, a relationship and we are more interested in the relationship to the people than to say, we do everything on our own. It's not. So coming on to the relationship, um, what is the financial element of, of the relationships that you are, you are involved with? Um, there's clearly been, a, you know, historically a view that, oh, a brand's involved, you know, they're going to write us a big check, and it's everyone's going to get you know, really happy about that. Is that the case, um, Theo? Are you right, still writing big checks? Are you going to be writing big checks? I really wish I had a massive checkbook, but um, I think you know the business has changed. Uh, the traditional sponsorship deals, specifically in my sector, are are gone. You know those those pieces are. We see ourselves more as a partnership now. So I think you know um, we were talking backstage, but we did a. We, when we do like a really support an artist, there can be 60, 70 people working from my business on it they all get paid every day that's a huge cost out for us if we want to build an app we we don't have an app factory in the back of the back of the office where we can build them we have to go and pay someone to make those if we put on an event you know something like this everyone needs to get paid so there's there's a cost between the two so it's you know sort of a, a barter deal really ma mainly and i think that's how most people are working now they can see a lot of new artists and a lot of very developed artists um you know we worked with rihanna and after that we we were um, contacted by so many big managements because they were like, we want to work how you work because we're working on so many different levels. We're right at the front of the technology just by you know, the O2s of the world and, and Nokia's and all our other brands. We're right at the front of that technology. So that's where a lot of these artists want to be and we can facilitate that for them. Do you think that that's the difference then between music and sport? Because we, we read 
you know, every week in the Sunday Times or other papers about how David Beckham's getting this check and uh, Wayne Rooney's getting that check. Is, could could that model not apply to music, Eric? Um, depends depends on where, where the brand will go, I think, or wants to go. Um, of course, there are brands that want to have just sponsorship deals and have uh, some relation to big names, but then it's just a sponsorship deal. And I think um, this will be for very, very few artists what, what will happen, uh, this kind of sports sponsorship to the music business. Because all the rest, what we're looking for is creative people that want to, to drive to the, next, to the next level. And these guys are more interested in, that in, in driving it than in just making the check out of it. So the big names, I think, yeah, that's sponsorship deals. I think that's what we all, what we all see and what we all know. Um, but I think um, it's a very, very low amount of people, a very, very small amount of people that will have this way. And our idea is clearly not to do this to a higher extent because you need more the, the content drivers than, than the sponsorships. Yeah. I'd add to that. Um I think with sport, kids grow up from a really quite a young age seeing badging. And I think sport's very much a, a badging exercise where with music, to um, Theo's point, we at O2 don't put um, logos within our venues either because I think, you know, people that love and have a passion for music are quite cynical towards brands and even when artists come to us and say, well, you can badge your logo here, I'm like, I don't want, I don't want to do that and I don't, I'm not sure if you actually want your fans to kind of see um, that you may be, may be selling out. So I think there's a very big difference between sport and music. Clearly. Um, I'd like to throw it out for questions, really. Uh, I can keep going, but if anyone's got some points that would like to write the gentleman there in the blue. I, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear what you're saying. Just continue on there, the link between sport and music. Do you think some of that's tied back to within sport? Uh, when people go, like in England, to go see football games, it's pretty premium price tickets to go and see uh, Chelsea, Man United, etc. The fans are paying money all the way down the line, where a lot of things you've discussed here with music, people are expecting free content, free this, free that. There's not the, the revenue in there to be paying those big checks. Do you think this is a part of the thing? We devalue our own music, where sports, they make sure they keep the value. Um, anyone want to tackle that? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, think, that, I think that's um, exactly it. I think um, there's also just the, the history of it. I think sport has always been like that. Um, we obviously, as O2, we also sponsor England Rugby and have done through BT Days um, for about 16 years now, um, and, uh, um, and Arsenal as well, um, probably for about eight years now. Um, and those guys, you know, don't move an inch unless you write a check for them. And that's certainly been the attitude. Um, um, I guess that's how we treated them as a brand for a very long time. So you sort of just get stuck in a rut. Um, I actually looked after the Arsenal partnership for about six months at one stage and just refused to pay any, uh, pay any of the footballers to do anything because what they expect, they on one hand would be asking us for free gig tickets to go to the O2 and the academy venues. On the other hand, I'd be asking them to do something for free and they'd say no. And we built, actually worked out a really nice relationship whereas I could say to them, you do this for me, I'll give you this for free. Um, so I think, it's, I think there is a possibility that um, the relationships between brands and, and football clubs could change, but I think you're right with, with regards to consumers and the punter. They just have it ingrained in them that they're expected to pay every step of the way for football. Um, and the idea of the season ticket that you pay for up front for the rest of the year, even though you might only make one game, it's irrelevant. You, you know, you've still paid that out at the beginning. Anyone else want to have a uh, that? I think that's a, that's, that's a, a very good answer. Um, any qu or more questions? Um, yeah, I've done uh, events with Nokia in Dubai before, and um, how much influence do you guys have in different regions? I mean, as you, you're uh, obviously global, but how much influence do you have, say, in Dubai or other Middle Eastern regions? Um, so if it's a global uh, campaign, we let the markets choose. So how, how it works is it's quite democratic. We, we come up with a platform and a concept, maybe two or three different artists or two or, di two or three different platform ideas and then we let the markets um, come back to us and give us their feedback of which to work on and most of the time uh, we try to make it like a sort of collective process it's incredibly complicated and um, involves lots of conference calls at weird times of day but that's how we try to work it because we really need the local markets to engage on the piece and we found that 
um, from small events that we've done, they just run and run and run and run because lots of markets keep coming back and back and back. So we try to keep it that sort of process. And just because I've seen the sponsorship really drop off in the last year, so do you see that picking up much or like the music type of sponsorship has definitely decreased? What, from Nokia? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really work in sponsorship side. I do partnership, so we don't really look at it like a a checkbook type idea. It's much more about how we work in the partnerships and those pieces are still going on, but maybe not as global as they were last year. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask the panel some more. No. Um, to uh, enabling uh, the, the consumers to discover new music and uh, the new, you know, the new distribution and, and access. I mean, I'll, I'll ask this specifically to the O2 uh, representatives because you are a mobile network. Do you, do you think you're doing as much as you can to push new music to, to, to your audiences? Um, yeah, again, going back to what we do in the academies, I think that we do. Um, we have over a million customers now that have told us that they're interested in music. Um, so we're all, always working quite closely um, with the artists going throughout our venue. So I think one thing that we would say is that we're very committed to anyone that goes through an O2 venue. Um, I think that the challenge that you have with a handset now is with smartphones, um, uh, especially with iTunes, that's a big player in terms of getting people to buy music. Um, and as a network that has so many people on iPhone, um, you know, we're very much tied to what iTunes do in that area. Any other thoughts on that, Nuna? Um, I, I guess it's quite different at the OT. Obviously, there's the level of artists that we get through. Um, I guess when you talk about discovering new music, we'll, we'll focus on the support act that comes with the, with the headline act. Um, and then we work really closely with um, a label and agency, Pierce, who will work with um, the record labels. And in some instances, it may be a bit of a bargaining tip that they say, if we give you you know, this bit of content for Bieber, you have to take this bit of content for this new artist as well. Um, and we can distribute that on site via um, Bluetooth. So if a customer is standing queuing to pick up their ticket, um, our event staff, our angels, will ask them to switch their Bluetooth on and they'll get sent, you know, bits of content um, throughout their journey around the O2. Um, but again, we're, we don't sort of push it in their face. It's, you know, it's discoverable technology as yes. well as dis discovering music. Um, and we sort of have to remember that they've paid a lot of money to come to the O2 that night on, you know, on their transport as well as their tickets. And they're there to see the band that they want to see. Um, and we're just quite mindful of that. I'll just add to that, if that's all right. Um, yeah, we've just also launched a program called um, Download and Discover. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of a company called Fair Share Music, but they're 10 months old. And basically, if you buy music through them, 50% of the profit goes to a chosen charity. Um, and I think people are becoming um, more socially aware and they actually want to be giving something back to the community. So um, we've just done a, our, our first campaign, which is five free downloads of artists that aren't um, signed who give us a free track. and. We have probably a base of um, around our academies of about three million people that we can talk to once you start looking at Facebook and comms and all those people actually received information on this program and it's something that we're going to look to continue for the next 12 months. Well, that, that sounds like a fantastic uh, program. How, how do you get to be one of those five artists? Um, talk to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, we were, I mean, it's, it's fair share's responsibility to talk to the labels and... Um, and get those artists on board, but um, I, I had a couple come to me directly, and um, we've, got, we've got some really good artists on there. Well, I mean, that, 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 that is exactly, and I'm glad this came up, that's exactly one way where you know, brands are really helping in this area. Um, if brands are all about you know, engagement and loyalty, they need to keep providing their, their consumers with content so they can talk about it and they can share it. Uh, that, that's, the, that's fueling the fire. Um, Eric, you, you, you work in this area. How, how are you getting the new music out there? Um, the distribution is, is, is running as that, it's running online, so meaning there is, there is uh, the upload function where, where the music is uploaded, so people will, will get it there. But there is the function around Beatbot that is going there. So we're, 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 not, we're, not trying to, as that, we're not trying to run a record label and say, okay, click on, on this and it's downloaded to iTunes. This is not our, our, our business model. Our business model is about finding creative people that want to create with the passion music and uh, share it with others and, and getting there. And I think that's what, what we try to do on, on Burn Studios. So there is a connection where they can upload it and uh, 
to, to showcase it to the world. But it's not a record label, I think that's, that's a difference. No, I, I, th I think we, we understand that. Um, what, for, for you, though, what, what, what's a, what's, what does success look like for something that's come out of Burn Studios? How, how would you measure that? For the user, uh, I think that's very, very depending on, on the user itself. So, like for example, like uh, Matt, yest Matt from Beatport yesterday uh, was telling he's making his music just for him own, for for his own. So it's not really sure. It's just for his creative process. So this could also be uh, something where he's satisfied with. For others, the benchmark will be if they have uh, one thousand or two thousand or ten thousand um, uh, people listening to it. Or selling it on, on Beatport, so that's that's different. I think from everybody who is who is there, so every cons every every user is different on this. For us, I think the the benchmark is as more people we engage to go there and create music. And this is coming back to the point what Richie Hotin was saying yesterday. It's about opening the whole story and getting more people engaged to to be creative, and that's the benchmark for us. So to grow this this way at the moment, there are eighty thousand people producing on this on this page. And if at the end of the year there will be 200,000, this will be a success for us. So meaning to get more and more people into a creative process. That's our... Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the other thing that you're doing uh, well is, is sort of facilitating creativity, yeah. which uh, you know, if I think most brands would realize that the more they can get their consumers to interact with them, the more chance they have of building that loyalty and that, that, that top of mind. And that's something that, that you're very involved in. Theo, is that an area Nokia would look to pursue? More interactivity with the consumer? Or are you happy where you are being a, an enabler? Um, I, I think we interact already. So, uh, so when we run a campaign, it, it, it's not just on a phone. It, we use the, all the social media channels. Um, you know, we also look at just not just the music, but also like access to the artist. So we um, built an app called Gig Finder, which goes into your phone, sees what music you've got, works out where you are in the world, and then tells you um, if that band's playing in the next two weeks, and if you want to buy a ticket, go and buy a ticket. So we're trying to do the whole piece. Um, it's not just about getting the track, it might be to go and see them live, um, and you didn't know they were playing because you've just landed in Ibiza or somewhere like that. And suddenly, you know, we open up that opportunity to more access to the artist. Anything from... Uh I mean, you, you, you clearly are doing this yeah, enormously, yeah. so... Yeah, no, I think, um, what, I think what we've worked hard to do as a brand is kind of um, take the... Pre, like, from pre-gig, where our customers get um, tickets 48 hours before they go on general release, right up to when they actually get to the gig. Um, you know, Facebook has become quite key. It's a, it's a music community that we've formed all around our 15 venues, and, and then off the back of that is now our YouTube channel. Um, and we know that's where our community is, so we're constantly feeding them with content and competitions and, um, you know, information that... Um, means that our venues are always top of mind. Um, we've got an Academy app that's about to come out um, and we're actually, I've got a similar technology that we're going to launch um, where our customers can download um, the application, see what's in their iTunes, Spotify playlist and then be told what gigs are coming up on priority ticketing. So we're very much about talking to our customers one-to-one -one and making sure that we're giving them the information that they want. So moving on now to the 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 negative side of all this brand integration. Um, festival season is nearly upon us. And, you know, my, my recent experience of festivals is just absolute bombardment um, by, by consumer brands, wh you know, wherever you turn. Um, do you think we, we're, we're close to tipping point here? Do you think it's getting to a stage where there's too much, certainly in the live arena, Nula? Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that what we've found in the last couple of years in... The, um, that we obviously find quite a unique model with priority ticketing, where we had a clear benefit for our customers and a clear benefit for the artists and promoters and venues that we work with. Um, um, and like Theo said, we you know we don't write checks. We it's all value and kind. We show what benefit we can give to them, and, and they give us what we want in return. Um, but there are other brands who sort of sort of come stomping into that arena and write you know enormous checks to artists just to get pre-sales or other names that they attribute to basically the same proposition that we have. Um, but I, I don't think there's any longevity in that because what they don't have, we've got bricks and mortar that we can sustain that model. Um, and we have like 5,000 gigs going through the academies, 200 events going through the O2 every year. We can sustain that and we can build on that. Whereas a brand um, either has to see an enormous return from that check that they wrote quite 
quickly, um, or else they'll change strategy and move into something else. Um, so unless they've got you know a clear strategy around where they go from um, that, then you know, I think people are moving out of the music market because they're finding less and less sort of unique platforms to to build on, I guess, on a long-term basis. No, I, 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 I agree. I, I think it's, it's been, uh, with the honourable exceptions on the panel, I think it's been a fairly uh, static and um, uninteresting market for brands for a, a number of years. Um, Eric, you, you don't really get involved with the, the, the sort of festival circuit. W where do you see that that might be going wrong for some brands? Um, yeah, I, think, I think for us it's, it's uh, very clear, so if, it, if it's just about, um, if you're not adding something to the culture, just putting the, the banner there, or the logo there, um, people will reject immediately, so the community will reject it because they will not, they will not take it as, a, as, a, as an effort for them. So uh, we are in the festival season, so we are doing three to four festivals, uh, but try to focus again, uh, bringing the, the Burn Studios there, a record studio there where people can record the tracks. Um, but to get teach by, for example, Gomma Record or our ambassadors how to how to make music. It's more about engaging the people with the with, with the brand than to put the logo there. And therefore, we have to select the right spots, of course. But um, I think I think um, coming back to the point, I think bannering, so meaning putting logos anywhere without adding something, so without adding some artists or adding some content, will not make the deal in the future for for the brands that really want to keep involved. For short term, it is working, I think. So just for short term, bringing an artist or bringing a festival, putting a logo there, you get awareness. That's nice. But um, if you have a long term goal in the, in the music field, then it's not working for you, I think. And um, any questions here before I finish up with the last question to the panel? Um, so uh, just to, to finish with, I'd like to ask each one of the panel in turn. Um, what they would like, what they would like to say to you, the audience, the, the, the music makers, the, the promoters, the managers, the artists out there. Is there any particular thing that you'd like to say on behalf of your brand? I'll go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're about innovation. You know, we have 16 music venues throughout the UK, and we have budget to help sell tickets, and we have budget to do great things within those venues. So, um, yeah, think about think of us as, as someone that can really help you do something different. And we've worked with a lot of artists. Um, to do that, you know, created apps with augmented reality when it first started. So we're all we're all about doing um, cool, great things, and we're always about pushing the boundaries. So, as a brand, I'd say that's what we stand for. Leah, um, I just like to repeat that. Actually. <laughs> so, um, to be honest, I think you know we're in a very similar market. That you know, again, we're always looking at the front end of the technology, um, and I think both sides of the party here, uh, my side on the brand, a technology brand, and and on the artist side, always looking at new and engaging ways of how we can engage with the consumer. Um, and if you've got some of those ideas with the new technology that's coming through, we, we, we want to hear about it because we're in that space. So, you know, please come and talk to us. Yeah, I think for us, it's uh, the most important thing that um, all of you go, go to the Burn Studios and uh, give us feedback and how to, how, how to become better. I think that's all the things so for us as a brand. It's very important to get the feedback out of the community and out of the scene to, to become better and better on what we're doing and to support the community in, in the creative process more and more. So if we don't get your feedback, I think it's very obvious that we will stay or stand on the same point for a longer time. And if you give uh, us the feedback how to improve, I think that's, that's why we want to invite you and to go out and produce music. I think that's, that's what we want to see in Burn Studios. Nula, anything to add? Um, well, obviously, just yeah. reading what, what Jazz says, but you know, I think... Um, you know, as time goes by, people are embracing what we do more. Our, our name is above the door in so many venues here, and I think people just need to continue embracing it. There's no jiggery-pokery. We're not trying to <laughs> trick anybody out of anything. You know, we're genuinely trying to provide a benefit to our, our customers, which ultimately are going to be your band's fans. Um, one in four people in the UK is an O2 customer. Um, you know, we're all talking to the same people, so, you know, at this bluntness form, take advantage of the fact that we've got a marketing budget to help you um, do bigger and better things. I, I would just add that, that this, is, this is a growing area. Um, you know, that we are in a, con a world of, of content now and trying to get, get people's attention through it. That, that isn't going to go away. That's only going to get bigger. And you, as the content makers, as the providers of the experience, I think it's going to be very exciting over the next few years. And, you know, it's down to you really to help these guys with some innovative ideas because th they've been very clear what their goals are, which is engagement and awareness and creativity. Um, 
I think the dialogue can only only improve and get better. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.